Okay, just a quick reminder of the bounds of the hall. Visitors and town employees on my right side and registered voters with this evening's orange passes in the, in the remainder of the hall. And with that, we're uh, ready to get underway with Article 38, Lighting, to Fran de Young. Mr. Moderator, fellow citizens, my name is Francis DeYoung. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Planning Board. The Chairman uh, is again out sick this evening. Article 38. We move that the Town vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the Town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 38 of the Annual Town Meeting Warrant. The Planning Board held a public hearing of the proposal on February 6, 26, 2018. The Board at that time voted unanimously, I'm sorry, on March 12th to recommend the town meeting adopt the change. The planning board proposes to regulate non-residential lighting that shines out of the windows or other openings at night when businesses are closed. Again, this is not exterior lighting, this is interior lighting that shines outward during hours that the businesses are closed. There's a safety valve included in the bylaw where an applicant can apply to the planning board for a special permit if the lighting is important and it is appropriate to that particular location. To be clear, these restrictions only apply to businesses when they are closed. The board thinks that when businesses are closed, they should not be uh, lit up. This can be, it can be a nuisance to residential abutters. It re, uh, exhibits a glow that limits our ability to see the sky at night. And it also has envir environmental impacts on wildlife from the lighting. It should come as no surprise that the board, the planning board, and I've been on it four years now, talks almost once a year about this subject. There's always a robust discussion. This bylaw is important to preserve the quiet nighttime feel of the town, the integrity, and the integrity of the residential neighborhoods. It, it allows some additional checks and balances of the board for those commercial buildings and the, again, it's the interior lighting that's shining exterior on the outside. Mr. Moderator. Is there any discussion, any questions? <clears throat> Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Offensive lighting is kind of like pornography. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. I, I found the bank lighting, which kind of triggered this bit, to be offensive. It was offensive to the neighbor, the resident, who lived right across the street. And quite frankly, I thought it was offensive to the other businesses across the street, the other street. And I didn't like the glow when I was patronizing one of the businesses across the street and was surprised when I saw it. As Fran DeYoung said, the planning board struggled with lighting in the past. And no good solution has ever been found that scientifically defines what offensive light is. And the whole problem with this, say, bylaw is that's incredibly difficult to kind of do. The planning board's also struggled with signs in the windows. We don't allow neon signs on the exterior of our businesses, but we have the neon open signs in the windows in the businesses, so what's the difference between a sign or a window, or a sign in the window or a sign on the outside of this building? I think the planning board should add a new condition to their decisions of site plan review. And they perhaps should have made a change to the criteria in the site plan review bylaw to strengthen it. Maybe this bylaw should have some th words that talk about light that trusses, trespasses over the property line. 
or at least at a level or something. This is a very subjective bylaw. Whether this is a really a good bylaw or bad bylaw, I'm on the fence, and I'll be listening very carefully to my fellow town meeting voters, and I will make up my mind in the next couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I um, I speak out against this um, article. This is a private business. It seems like it businesses all overall, but this seems to be targeted at one business that's actually been an extremely good citizen. Um, their purpose of that light is actually to like honor things like Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, it's not on past like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. Um, and in the other communities that this business is in, um, whether it's Northbridge and Whitensville and Uxbridge, they actually embrace this business in the light. They actually get they, they get excited, celebrate. It's like the Sitco sign. Oh, uh, this is going to be lit up at Christmas. We're not talking about one specific business. Right. Let's keep this think, to the, let's keep right. this to the bylaw. I, I think it just like Ken said, it came, it was <clears throat> stimulated because of one business, but that I think some it, limiting it down just to holiday lighting, I think is too much, and that it, it limits a business owner. It's a private business. On my left. Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street, um, also a member of the planning board. Um, I want to be clear that this is an opportunity for the planning board um, not to retroactively target any business. It, it will never apply to a business that is already established. Um, and it's not meant to sort of judge a particular business on their, their style choices. But it is an opportunity for the planning board to have a structured discussion and consideration of whether interior lighting that doesn't serve as uh, a business necessary or safety necessary that is actually intended to be an external feature can be discussed and controlled by the planning board. Um, I certainly am fully in favor of this. The, the planning board voted, I think, unanimously in favor of this. And it's just an opportunity for us to uh, respond to a, a emerging uh, situation where um, lighting can become, um, from behind glass walls or glass windows, can become an external feature and may or may not be appropriate in particular locations. Uh, can I direct a, a question to the planning board, because I'm not sure uh, of one of the statements that you made, Muriel, and that is whether this applies to existing businesses. Uh, it's not going to be retroactive to businesses that currently have lighting that exhibits from the inside to the outside, if, that, if that's the question. So in other but, words, it, it only applies to, biz, to, to, to new lighting in new businesses that, uh, that come into town? It, it would apply to um, new businesses that want to um, have lighting that shines on the, to the exterior. Okay, right? thank you. On my right. Uh, John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. We, we have to talk about property rights. Can't hear you, John. We have to talk about property rights here. You know, it, it, in this bylaw, it's saying that one can go to um, the ZBA or the planning board to get a special permit in order to keep lights on at night. Well, there might be a bank or a real estate office or, or another business that likes to have the lights on so when, so when there's a patrol going by, they can look inside the building and see that it's okay. And then, but who's to say whether it's too bright or not bright enough just because uh, the lights are on inside? Now, I can understand controlling uh, lights outside where light trespass can go beyond the property lines. But if we start controlling interior lighting, that's a very, very slippery slope. And, and it's very subjective, and I am, I am definitely against this, uh, this article. On my right again. Yes, I have a question. Uh, Matthew Ronka, Six Black Thorn Circle. I have a question for the planning board, a point of information. Uh, so what constitutes hol uh, holiday lighting under this, under uh, item B1 there? So without a technical definition, I would think anything that, that uh, you know, represents the holidays between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Okay, so simply, you know, hot Christmas lights, reindeer, things of that nature. <laughs> okay, so specifically Judeo-Christian holidays. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Is that defined anywhere, or is that just... Easter bunnies? Um, and second question on that, 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 on that point. Um, so the exemptions, I assume, are the things that do not need a special um, permit. Um, it seems like lighting used for security purposes <coughs> is also covered under the valid uh, That's exempt. reasons. That's exempt, correct. Right, but also it, it seems like even if we were to strike section B entirely, it that would be explicitly covered under way, reasons why you'd be able to get a special permit. Is that a reading of that? Correct. Okay. Mr. Weismantel. Ken Weismantel, 145 Ash Street. I disagree with uh, the Vice Chairman of the Planning Board and Muriel Kramer that this bylaw as written will not be retroactive. Basically, you will have a bylaw in the zoning bylaws where you can go as a citizen and say to the zoning enforcement officer, that building does not meet this bylaw and he will have to make a determination of whether it is not. And if he does determine that that's an offensive interior light, then he finds for the zoning bylaws, uh, which I think is $300 a day or I'm not sure. Yeah, $300 a day. So basically, why don't this, we get, is, this does not just apply to new site plan review. Why don't we get clarification from town council? Okay, so all zoning bylaws uh, apply only prospectively. Anything that is, exists before the zoning bylaw goes into effect is what's called a pre-existing non-conforming use, and it is protected. So. Um, it, so what that means is that this bylaw would apply uh, to new businesses that come in and want to have lighting, and it would apply to existing businesses that didn't used to have the lighting but decided they wanted to initiate it, new lighting. Uh, but it would not apply to existing businesses that um, uh, already um, have lighting that doesn't com that doesn't conform. They would be allowed to continue to do to operate as before. Um, uh, and while I've got the microphone, um, I would interpret holiday lighting more broadly than the vice chair of the planning board. Uh, a holiday is whatever you think a holiday is. Anything you'd like to to um, uh, celebrate in terms of uh, a special day, Mother's Day. Um, uh, Fourth of July, whatever it is, um, uh, not necessarily religious, not necessarily secular, any holiday that is being celebrated would, uh, in, in my view, uh, be exempt from the requirements of this bylaw. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. How would you monitor this? I mean, it would be through you, the zoning enforcement officer. I mean, is someone going to come out there and say the lights are too bright, things like that? There's some sort of measurement. Someone's going to get paid to do this and a cost to the town? As council mentioned last night, there are areas of subjectivity, and that would be up for the zoning enforcement officer to make that call. The other comment I wanted to make was that, you know, we're desperately talking about wanting to bring businesses into town, attract businesses into town. This seems just one more burden that a business that might need extra security lights including many retail establishments or a medical establishment need additional security lights um, that th those are interior that people can glance in and see. Um, it just seems like we're making it harder, one more thing to make it hard for a new business to come in. And Muriel, or did you I want to respond, Fran? Just to clarify that uh, uh, lighting for security purposes is exempt from this bylaw. Muriel? Yeah, through you, Mr. Moderator, I just want to make sure that people understand that we are, uh, we are positively motivated um, and not trying to um, be obstructive in any way. We recognize that there is a, there's new technologies every day, and people take advantage of those technologies as they should. Um, but, for example, a glass building that lights up or other internal light features that become external features may or may not be something that the residents of Hopkinton um, would appreciate in a particular spot. So this just gives the planning board an opportunity to uh, have a review, a structured review, and a bylaw in place. 
Okay, seeing that there is no further discussion, I'm going to call for a vote. <clears throat> this is Article 38, Lighting. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Uh, we're going to get our exercise early. This is a two-thirds requirement, so the, all those in favor, please stand. Eight on the stage. Center back fourteen. 14, center rear. On the left, 19. 19 on the left. Center front, 15. Center front, 15. Right side is 17. 17 on the right. Okay, all those opposed, please rise. Gotcha. Four on the stage. Center front 12. Center front 12. Center back 5. Center back 5. Eight on the right. Right side 8. On the left 23. 23 on the left. Okay. 73 in favor, 52 opposed, it fails. Again, it needed to be a two-thirds majority. Thank you, Fran. Article 39, Nuisance and Dangerous Dog. Mr. Catino. We move, the mo we move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. And the Board of Health Administrator is going to speak to this? Uh, no, I am, sir. Here, okay. This article proposes to bring existing barking dogs general bylaw into compliance with the state law that provides regulations, process, and definitions for how the town needs to deal with the nuisance and dangerous with nuisance and dangerous dogs, the definition of nuisance and dangerous dogs are contained in the statute. Um, the town's current bylaw doesn't mention the terms at all. Only notes that people can file a complaint relative to barking, howling, or other activity that disturbs the peace and quiet or endangers the health or safety of someone. Excessive barking is included in the nuisance dog, dog definition, but there is other behavior regulated under the law that isn't included in our bylaw. Under the law, someone can make a complaint about a dangerous dog or a nuisance dog to a hearing authority. Contrary to the, to the law, our bylaw directs the complaints to the town manager, the animal control officer, and the police department. Our current bylaw says that after an investigation, an ACO may make a rel relative to restraint or disposal of the dog. There are other options that, uh, than restraint or death. 
Plus, there is a hearing process that is laid out to the law. The proposed bylaw will bring the town into compliance with the current law and provide a fair and deliberate way to deal with the issue. The current bylaw doesn't describe the processes at all, which leads to confusion. Although the statute indicates that someone can make a complaint and have a public hearing before a hearing authority, the bylaw doesn't mention the ability to have the hearing at all. In the proposed bylaw, the hearing authority is identified as the Board of Selectmen. The proposed bylaw references, but doesn't always repeat what is in the law. It fills in some administrative gaps. The, the proposed bylaw goes into more detail than the statutes with respect to how the dogs are to be handled between the time of a complaint is made and when the hearing is held. Because future animal control officers, boards of selectmen, uh, complainants, and the dog owners should have guidance in this regard. The bylaw provides for temporary restraint orders and confinement orders, which are tools that the ACO can use if needed. It is important to update this bylaw because the complaints need to be taken seriously and dealt with legally, professionally, and fairly. The existing bylaw doesn't provide the tools to do that, leaving residents on both sides of a complaint dissatisfied. Is there any discussion? Um, Carol Dever, 47 Chamberlain Street. I actually read the state's regulations regarding nuisance dogs and how to deal with them, and that statute is incredibly onerous. So I'm curious as to why what currently exists in Hopkinton is the rules surrounding this is no longer <clears throat> adequate. Is there a huge problem that, that I'm unaware of? Or I just would like a little clarification as to why this came about. Mr. Cotino. Yes, it actually came about uh, um, along with a, um, what was supposed to be a control of fowl also. But we decided to uh, leave that part out and just uh, deal with the, the nuisance and dangerous dogs. But basically what happened was that, there, there at, like I said, presently there, are, there is just no process. And this is just putting some processes and guidelines in place so that, so that uh, if there is a complaint, the dog has to be taken away, where it's going to go, what's going to happen, who the complaints go to, and what's gonna, what, what the whole shebang happens. On my right. Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. I'm curious why this is limited just to dogs. Clearly, it seems no one has experienced a very angry goose, for instance. How about miscreant children? <laughs> Muriel. <clears throat> then, to be clear, I'd be all in. Um, so uh, what is the grievance process? I'm a little, um, I'm a little concerned about this, uh, all the teeth in this bylaw with no uh, real identified nuisance dog problem. We've eliminated the chickens. Apparently they were a problem, but we handled that without a bylaw. Um, what, what, is, what is the process for a home a pet owner um, to protect themselves, their families, and their pet in this process? Well, there are definitions in here. I, I decided not to read, get into too many of them. Um, what is a nuisance dog? A dog that, one, by excessive barking or other disturbance is an annoyance to a sick person residing in the vicinity, or by excessive barking causing damage or other interference, a reasonable person would find such behavior disruptive to one's quiet and peaceful enjoyment, or three, has threatened or attacked livestock, a domestic animal or a person but such a threat or attack was not grossly disproportionate reaction under all the circumstances. Uh, so uh, I have a follow-up and a comment. Um, so to be clear, you could remove a dog because they bark too much? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read. I'll, I'll no, don't. Get, I'm just asking you. No, I, I'll, Would I'll, you be able to remove a dog from a home because they bark too much? Right, and please I'm, let going, to, I'm going to try to explain it to you if you give me a second. Uh, what are the board's options for, for action after a hearing? Nuisance dog complaint. Either dismiss the complaint or deem the dog a nuisance dog. Order the owner to take remedial action and cause of the, uh, uh, dismiss the nuisance behavior. Dangerous dog complaint. Sorry, I, my glasses broke. I'm using all four glasses right here. Uh, dangerous dog complaint. Dismiss the complaint. Deem the dog a nuisance dog or deem the dog a dangerous dog. If the dog is d deemed a dangerous dog, then the board could choose from the following options provided by the law. 
humane restraint, confined to the premises, muzzled or restrained when off the premises, owner to provide proof of insurance of not less than $100,000, provide proof of information that the dog may be identified through its lifetime, either a microchip, tattoo, or photos, spray, spay or neuter, or humane uh, euthanization. Okay, uh, it appears that barking is not, does not trigger your removal. Um, I, I do want to know what the grievance process is for homeowners, pet owners in Hopkinton. If I may, through the town moderator. Um, there's a simple three-step process. The first step is making a complaint in relation to a nuisance dog, a dangerous dog. And then number two, the complaint is then investigated and addressed in accordance with the state law. And then number three, prior to any hearing, if there's need for the town to take any action, that determination will be made by the animal control officer. And then finally, a hearing is held. On my right. Brendan Tedstone, Pleasant Street. Um, is the animal control officer here to speak to this? No, we do have the um, land use director, uh, okay. operations director, who is in charge of that department, as well as the animal inspector. Okay. So I find too much subjectivity in this uh, article uh, for someone to deem a dog dangerous. Uh, I get the barking part, but the dangerous dog to you might not be a dangerous dog to me, might be a not dangerous dog, but might be one to the neighbor. Um, I see this as one of these articles that kind of takes the um, neighborhood out of the town where if I had a problem with the dog and it was your dog, I would generally go over and have a discussion with you and explain to you why I don't have, why I don't feel safe with that dog out there. Um, this allows it a little bit more passive aggressive to go to a zoning control officer and not have to deal with these people face to face and it puts them, it taxes their services and it puts them in a, in a tougher spot. So uh, I'm against this article and um, I just, uh, there's just too much subjectivity when it comes to this. Thank you. On my left. Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. Um, I just wanted to ask what our experience has been with complaints about dogs in recent years. Um, have there been complaints? I understand the procedure has been somewhat vague, but um, what has happened? Is this a problem that's been pressing? Through the town moderator. Yes, at town hall we do receive numerous concerns or complaints regarding barking or nuisance animals. Um, and a follow-up, Mr. Moderator, um, do you have statistics on that as to the numbers of each? I do not have the statistics readily with me now. Thank you. On my right. Uh, I'm Shirley Arthur from Seven Hidden Brick. Um, I just wanted to clarify your definition for dangerous breed. Are you going to follow the state of Massachusetts definition on what dangerous breed is, meaning it's not going to be based on breed, but based on past history? The, through the town moderator, the answer is yes. Okay. And also, if I may, to be clear, the town is not creating anything new in this bylaw. Okay. What the town is doing is simply updating our town bylaw to line up with the state regulations. Why are we doing that? We are doing that for the following reasons. Number one, we do receive complaints. And what we have found out from the complaints is that people are not familiar with the state regulation. And therefore, the purpose of putting together this regulation is public education. Number two, we want to build transparency. We believe our town bylaws afford that opportunity. And number three, we want to set clear expectations for the town staff who enforce these rules. We also need education and continuous and constant reference to town bylaws 
is part of our education. Okay, thank you. On my left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Terry, 17 Maple Street. I'm a little concerned about the job of dog officer. I know it's hard to find someone, especially someone who's trained, and we do find someone that's trained. I think we should leave the authority with him rather than five untrained selectmen. Uh, and it's very easy to pick up the phone and call the dog officer at any day or night, any time. It's difficult to get a hold of the selectmen as a body unless you're getting for the right Tuesday night. And also, as far as the dogs barking, I can sit out on my deck over here in Maple Street on a Tuesday evening or a Sunday afternoon, and I hear more noise from the guns that are coming from the, the, the gun shooting range over on Lumber Street than I do from any barking dogs. So I think it's hard to get a tree warden. It's hard to get a dog officer. I think we should respect them and give them the authority the job deserves. On my right. Nancy Peters, 258 Wood Street. And my experience is having had a dog most of my life. And to Mr. Tetstone's point, I had a neighbor who had a dog that barked whenever I was out in the yard, which that was quite often. And I never made a complaint on it. I had a visitor one day who said, you should complain about that. And I said, I'm never going to make a complaint about a dog that barks. I have a dog also. That person complained, not because I requested it, but, re but complained on their own, which caused great embarrassment to my neighbor. They came talk to me about it. I said, I did not make a complaint. I would not make a complaint. So it is very subjective. Did it bother me? It bothered a visitor. But again, it's a judgment call as to whether this is annoying or a nuisance. Thank you. Mr. Weissmantle. Ken Weissmantle, 145 <coughs> Ash Street. Mr. Foster's dog asked me to call the question. <laughs> Is there a second? second? All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And it's clearly, uh, it's unanimous. So we, we have ended debate and we will now proceed to a vote on Article 39 the bylaw amendments for nuisance and dangerous dog. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. And it's a clear majority. And it passes. All right, let's, let's take a standing vote. All those in favor, please stand. I'm gonna be redeemed on this one. Nine on the stage. Center front, 13. Center front, 13. Right side, 17. 17 on the right. Center rear, 26. Center rear, 26. On the left, 17. 17 on the left. Okay, all those opposed, opposed please rise. Four on the stage. 
Center rear zero. Center rear zero. Nine on the right. Nine on the right. Center front 13. Center front 13. On the left, 23. On the left, 23. 49. Okay, for those who were doubting Thomas, 82 in favor, 49 opposed. And so it passes. Okay, we dealt with Article 40 last night. Now it's Article 41, Tobacco Bylaw. Mr. Catino. Mr. Moderator, we move the motion as printed in the, oh, in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. The Public Health Director will take over at this point. Good evening. For those of you who haven't met me, can't hear you. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Sean McCullough. I'm the health director in the town of Hopkinton. On April 23rd, 2018, the Board of Health. On April 23rd, 2018, the Board of Health amended our tobacco regulations to increase the minimum age at which one might purchase tobacco from 18 to 21. In anticipation of the regulatory change the existing tobacco bylaw was amended. Beyond the changes to the regulation, the bylaw took into consideration the age of those found in violation of the regulation. The parents of those under the age of 18 um, that are found in violation of the violation will be notified instead of being brought um, are being penalized under civil law. Got under, you uh, have to law. swallow the mic. Oh, sorry. So again, for those um, that are under the age of 18, the bylaw takes into consideration um, uh, their age, and instead of being found in civil violation, those individuals' uh, parents will be notified. Um, that's the main um, distinction between the Board of Health regulation in this bylaw. And otherwise, the bylaw um, simply brings into, uh, into union the um, minimum age of 18, um, yeah, the minimum age to buy tobacco from 18 to 21 in both the regulation and the bylaw. Are there any questions or discussion? On my right. Uh, Matthew Maraca, 6 Black Lawrence Circle. Uh, there appears to be several typographical errors in the warrant as printed outside, as well as inconsistencies between sections one, two, and the remainder of the, and then section three. Um, so I submitted a proposed amendment yesterday and I moved to amend the article as uh, 41 is shown in this copy here. If you want, I can read it. Does the amendment desk have it? I mean, and so these are specifically typographical issues? Uh, I believe they are, it's intended to clarify and some uh, typographical errors, um, such as uh, clarifying subclauses and proving parallel structure to make sure that uh, it's not just people selling both tobacco and products containing tobacco. Um, but either one of those, um, things along that line, as well as fixing monetary to be monetary to match the current uh, text. Okay. And so as a note to the meeting, town council has had an opportunity to review the typo changes that are being referenced here and, and, uh, and has done so. Okay, so the, the amendment, an amendment uh, to, to make some typographical and other wording changes has been uh, advanced. You can see some of the changes or all of the changes on the 
on the screen. It has been seconded. Is there discussion on these typographical corrections? Um, are those the only that are depicted, or are there more? No, there's more further down. So it's changing monetary, the, the spelling of monetary. Removing the word and and replacing it with, is it, well, is adding the word of? It should be or. Or of products containing tobacco. Sale of tobacco, oh no, either and. Either one's fun. So has it, has it been corrected to be and or? No, that's correct. Oh, and of product, okay. Or to product, okay. So it looks to me like what, what's being proposed as amendments represents what we would call Scrivener's errors, that um, correcting it so that there are no internal inconsistencies and that uh, the, the words are, are correctly expressed. Again, are there, is there other discussion on the amendment? Okay, hearing that there are... Sorry. I, I don't know whether this is part of the amendment or should be part of the amendment, but I'm confused as to why, why in Section 1 we're increasing the age to 21, um, that those people can't have tobacco or use tobacco or whatever, but in Section 2 we're talking about under the age of 18 we're going to confiscate it. Should that not be 21 also? Instead no. of fining, moderate. instead of fining the, uh, the youth that are 18 and the, the under, um, we're simply going to notify their parents. Or well, so that's not part of the amendment then. Okay, I just wanted to check. Right. Thank you. Again, any comments on the amendments? If there are no no further comments on the amendments, then I'll ask for a vote uh, of those who are in favor of adding the uh, amendment language to the article. So this is not a vote on the main article itself, but simply on the amendments. All those in favor of incorporating the amendments signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So the amendments are clearly incorporated. Uh, back to a discussion on the, the main motion itself. On my right. Good evening, Kevin Shea, Pleasant Street. I have to say I'm a little bit confused by the ages. When you're over 18 currently, it, can you buy tobacco? No. So you have to be 21 in order to buy tobacco. You have to be over 21 to buy tobacco. But if someone under the age of 18 is in possession of it, is that what, is that what you're saying? That they're in possession of it, not buying it? If, if someone under the age of 18 is caught with tobacco in lieu of a fine, they will be, um, their parents will be notified. Okay, and then on 3A1, it says you'll issue regulations prohibiting the consumption and use of tobacco uh, in public outdoor place by a person under the age of 21. So that is currently not the case? Currently, if you are in a public place um, and you are caught consuming under the age of 18, you're in violation and subject to civil penalty. Um, and if you're caught on a, in a public building um, and or in a workplace, you're subject to uh, a civil penalty under the uh, smoke-free workplace regulations. Um, that will be yeah. amended to 21. Okay, so the police 
will, will be the decision makers there of what, when to interact with a citizen who they think may be under 21? The, depending on the venue, in a school situation, it would be the school resource officer. Um, it could be the Board of Health, um, and it would be otherwise the police. Okay, and then this is all about tobacco and nicotine, but there's no mention here of uh, marijuana, cannabis. Do the same laws apply? The yes, my, that's my understanding is that the same laws would apply. Smoking. Well, let's let's turn that to uh, town council. Okay, so <clears throat> regulation of marijuana is uh, pursuant to uh, the elaborate regulatory structure of the uh, Cannabis Control Commission. Um, uh, we're not regulating marijuana in this bylaw. That's the, that's going to be done sep uh, separately. But we already do have a provision that we're not affecting today in our bylaws that um, restricts uh, um, uh, possession of marijuana um, in a public place and reduces the uh, the penalties to comply with um, state law. Okay. On my left. Um, thank you. Um, Ellen Rudder, Forest Lane. Um, through you, Mr. Moderator, I'm curious about um, e-cigarettes and the thing called Juul, which I really don't know what it is, but my kids do, and dabbing. All those things that are happening in the high school, according to them, all day, every day. Those regulations or those issues are handled under the Board of Health regulations. So there's already a regulation right. that addresses there's, there's, that? Yes, there is. And that's going into effect on July 1st, 2018. So the, those are not things that deliver nicotine? I, I guess I'm a little confused. The, the town has had two parallel regulations. They've had a bylaw and a regulation that have been parallel. Um, what we did when I came on was we sought to address the vaping issues and um, the underage or smoking in general. We sought to increase the age to 21 to limit uh, the accessibility and to help address um, the accessibility of vaping and the, um, the prevalence and the ease at which um, we could say seniors could uh, obtain items and then provide a, a secondary market within the high schools or even the middle schools. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Tedstone. Thank you, Brendan Tedstone, Pleasant Street. Um, so I guess my thought process on this, uh, and, and if I'm out of the four corners, please let me know. If we took the term tobacco out of this product, out of this article, it 18, would just be it the, would just be bylaw, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, a concern that I have on this is, what about the guy who's or girl who's 18 and a half, who's on their way to the marine recruiter? to go over to boot camp, they can go over and fight a war and they can, they're an adult, they can get drafted. They, there's, there's just a, it's a slippery slope where at 18 years old, they, we're now telling them that they can't make a decision to, to have a, a dip on their way to boot camp. And believe me, I, I'm for, like I, I'd like tobacco to be banned altogether. However, it isn't, and at the age of 18 where you're an adult, you're expected to act like an adult. Um, my concern is that we're taking another decision away from someone at 18 years old to make a conscious decision, um, and I just have a problem with that. So I guess I'm against this. In response, if I may, 
Okay, uh, go ahead. The military is in the process of removing tobacco products from bases across the United States in um, all of our territories. So they are moving in line with um, the regulatory action that we've taken. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Um, nope, forget it. Thanks. <laughs> On my left. Samantha Dings, three wordy circle. I am wondering if there are, if there is an exception being made, you know, with the Board of Health regulating this as far as nicotine replacement therapy. You know, if, if a 19 year old wants to kick the habit and, and Nicorette patches or gum will, will help that happen, will they be able to purchase those items? I think that's, that's outside of the scope of this article. This is simply regulation of those who are using <coughs> cigarettes. It's a nicotine containing product though. It contains nicotine. So uh, I stand corrected. Do you, Sean, is this something that you'd address? I believe under the Board of Health regulations, we take into consideration um, <coughs> prescription medication. Um, so if it's prescribed, um, but I would have to confirm that. Because actually, um, it's it can be take it can be bought over the counter even at CVS, which doesn't sell any other tobacco or nicotine products. Okay. On my right. Hi, uh, Susan Porter, 348 Wood Street, Hopkinton, obviously. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, I read in the paper today that the state of Massachusetts is considering this same um, restrict, restriction to bring tobacco products to age 21 for the entire state. So we may be, this may be a moot point anyway. So I just wanted people to know that this may be taken out of our hands anyhow. So. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask town council to comment on the on the uh, uh, nicotine suppression products. So this bylaw authorizes the board of health <coughs> to adopt regulations. So it, the point of this bylaw is simply to give the board of health the authority to adopt those regulations. The board of health has. Um, uh, regulations uh, in place already if they don't address the problem that has been raised that's a good point for the Board of Health to consider addressing that but it's not necessary to address it here because all this does is authorize them to adopt the regulations I mean is that clear in other words it's something that they could choose to uh, to incorporate and, and allow but on my left Dan Terry, 9 John Matthew Road. So I, I just have a question about, how, uh, I guess, the logic behind the number 18. Um, and and I'll, maybe I'll express my concern and, and, and you can uh, help uh, calm my fears or, or, or whatever. Uh, uh, we have 18 year olds in high school and 17 year olds in high school. And they're subject to MIA rules and suspensions and that type of thing. And it seems to me as though we're, we're subjecting that high school student because of the day that their birthday is to a, a different level of enforcement because if a 17 year old ca gets caught he or she would get spoken to by his or her parents but the 18 year old would have a, a, a fine and a ticket and therefore I believe would be subject to uh, school policies um, I, I guess maybe, maybe I need to ask the school department to what extent do the rules change with the 17 and 18 year old or to the police department to what extent is there communication if, 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 the, um, if, if the infraction infraction for one boy or girl is to have a conversation with their parents and the other is a, a fine that they have to pay at the at the in a court system I'm just wondering how the school system would react and whether there's any conversation a difference in the conversation between the school and the police department so to address the the age in the the punishment 
the Board of Health regulation does not uh, have a, uh, or does not differentiate between the penalty. The bylaw has that to take into consideration and limit the ability to fine um, and to take into consideration that for a child under the age of 18, um, calling their parents um, might be a more uh, noxious penalty than issuing the family a uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, what, what are the alternatives for a 17-year-old in, in terms of the punishment, if you will? Under the existing... With, with what was proposed. With, in other words, under the proposed bylaw, what... <clears throat> I mean, I think you've expressed it, that, that uh, the appropriate authority would have a discussion with the parents about which, the... Which is what I thought. Yeah. So, that, so right. okay. So that, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, so, so we don't. So we don't. So so does potential, at for high school students be to be treated differently based on when their birthday is. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And then one one uh, other question. So it's a school resource officer that would have this conversation. If I suppose, if the individual were caught in the school what, on the what school if, grounds. What if it's someone from out of town? I mean, is this? Uh, is it, well, if they're. If they're caught on school grounds, um, they're either. Oh, I'm sorry. I, this is just about school grounds. No, it's not about. Oh, it's. So if if someone under the age of 18 is caught, they'd either fall under the bylaw, um, the regulatory bylaw, or the board of health regulation. So it's it depends on the situation, who the regulatory authority is at you know, at the time. So if it's on school, it could be the school resource officer. If it's in a public building, it could be the police officer. Um, it could be the health agent. Thank, thank you for the clarity. I, I uh, am completely opposed to this article because of the vagueness and the inability to, uh, to, to answer a few of these simple questions. On my right, Claire. Clay Wright, 28 Hayden Row. Um, I, I am really conflicted about this article because I hate cigarettes, I hate cigarette smoke, I hate having it around me. Um, but at the same time, my cousin joined the Marines when he was 16, and in that age range, he was fighting in Vietnam. My nephew was probably barely scraping the 21, and he was flying a mission over in Afghanistan. And we know that if we were attacked tomorrow, um, you register for the secret for the uh, mil military at 18, and there could be a draft tomorrow, and 18-year-olds would be called up. Um, in so much of our society, 18 is considered adulthood and an age of consent, and I have a problem with the almost criminalization fining for an age group that, through for many other major uh, uh, issues in our society, an 18-year-old is considered an adult. And when your kids go to college, you will find that they won't even give your grades to you once the child turns 18, because as far as they're concerned, they're not a child, they're an adult. So um, I don't have the right answer, but particularly what's expected of our young men and women relative to defending this nation. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm really conflicted. Just. On my left. Eric Son at 60 Teresa Road. Mr. Moderator, I have always been under the opinion that any bylaw, law, or regulation to be effective should be easily explained to the people that are concerned and affected by it. I don't know what this article says. I defy anybody in this room to explain it to an 18-year-old of what this means. Based on that, I would suggest that the Board of Health go back and rewrite it in a way so it's easily explainable. Thank you. I, I take it you're opposed to this article. <laughs> on my right. John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. I, I guess it's just a libertarian in me that, that's just, it's a slippery slope again. Um, when we were raising the age to 18, I could understand it. I, I'm against smoking, I don't smoke. Well, my 
father-in-law actually went to ask if he marry his daughter, he maybe smoke a cigar. But other than that, um, I, I'm opposed to smoking. Uh, uh, there's no smoking in any public buildings. There's no smoking. There's, smoking's banned just about everywhere already. But if we're, if, if we're going to put it on, the, make it incumbent upon the police to have to make a determination the person walking up the street or standing on a corner is 18 or 21 and, and, then, ask them, and, and then have to ask them, uh, you know, are you, are you 21? Oh, no, you're only 18. Okay, uh, uh, give me those cigarettes. Or you're 17, I can understand it, the high school stuff. But um, I just think it's, it, it's, a, it's a really slippery slope. It's a Fourth Amendment thing to me is a, a illegal search and seizure where, where how do you know if somebody's 18 or 21? I, I can't tell. I'm 60 now. I, I think everybody's young. Thank you. On my left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Pat O'Brien, 13 Ray Street. Um, just to echo Mr. Sonnet's concern, I'm confused. Um, I, you know, between the amendment. We have um, a young voter who wants to weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, all the issues that came up uh, are legit. Um, but, you know, before I could vote, I'd just like to understand, you know, I, I'm not even sure what the current bylaw is, what you want to change. Um, so, if you could help me out there and uh, kind of decipher so, that for us, I appreciate it. So, the Board of Health, we reviewed the existing regulation, and then to bring the the Board of Health regulation into um, or bring it consistent with the other Metro West towns and the other 166 communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and to promote um, our mission to protect the pu uh, public health, we elected to make a decision to raise the tobacco age from 18 to 21. So we made a regulatory change. Um, it, went in, it was passed on the 23rd, and um, yeah, we held the hearings no one attended, we passed the regulation. Then this regulation, this bylaw was then um, amended to bring it up to speed with the regulation. There are some issues apparently from our discussion that need to be uh, addressed. However, this, the mission is, again, to protect the public health um, we have an existing regulation that will go into effect on July 1st in the town, and then uh, we will bring the bylaw and the regulation into a, uh, like, we will make the amended changes um, addressing the issues that have been addressed at this meeting. Um, and as Ray said, um, the regulation, this bylaw, allows the Board of Health to make regulations, and it's my understanding that we can bring the two and marry the two together, correct? I, I wonder if we could ask uh, Attorney yeah. Miaris to, to help clarify the situation as it relates to this. All right, I'll, go, I'll, I'll give it a shot. We have a bylaw in place now. The bylaw that we have in place now prohibits um, consumption of tobacco products by uh, persons under the age of 18 in outdoor public places, okay? It does not regulate sales. Uh, the, this bylaw would repeal all of that and it would authorize the Board of Health to adopt regulations it would allow them to adopt regulations raising the, the uh, age limit to 21 and also to, to prohibit sales um, to persons under 21, okay? Uh, again, it would be consumption in a, in a public place that, that is what's being regulated. Um, so it would authorize them to adopt regulations that would raise the, the age from 18 to 21. Now, what's a little confusing here is that the existing bylaw has this provision that says um, if, if you're in violation of the existing bylaw, 
um, there isn't a monetary penalty. There's a, uh, a uh, provision that you have to report it to the person's parents. So that's been retained in the new bylaw, but not for um, uh, people all the way up to 21, just for people under 18. So that's kept exactly the same. So for people between 18 and 21, they imposed a penalty, $100 penalty. So that, that's what it's all about. Through the, mo through the moderator. Thank you very much. That helped out a bit. Um, just a question back. They said the Board of Health passed regulations. So what does that mean? They passed regulations. Is that enforceable now if this bylaw goes down? Uh, what, what are the regulations you passed? And so those reg the regulations that they have adopted would go into effect on the 1st of July, pursuant to the authorization that you're going to give them if you pass this tonight. If you don't give them um, that authorization, then their regulations will be in violation of our bylaw, and they will have to change, uh, to change it. If you just repeal the bylaw completely, they would have the authority to adopt those regulations. But because, but because um, uh, that's not one of the things that is, uh, uh, that's being proposed here, it, the, the, uh, the proposal is to explicitly authorize them to go up to 21. Thank you. On my right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mary Jo Andrikan, 2 College Street. I'm concerned about the language, the broad language that says products containing tobacco or nicotine. I personally know people who've quit smoking using over-the-counter nicotine gum. And this article basically gives a blank slate to the Board of Health, if I understand correctly. Mr. Moderator, would it be proper to ask through you, the members of the Board of Health who are here, that they would properly word regulations so that uh, the, such nicotine-containing products would not be prohibited in any way to anyone? You may ask, but your voice uh, wouldn't carry to them since they're not in the room. Oh, we have, we have one more. Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, Michael King, 189 Hidden Row. I'm a member of the Board of Health. Um, it's a good point. We didn't actually think about uh, smoking cessation products that would have nicotine in them, so I think that's something we should probably add to the regulations. Does that answer the question? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, <clears throat> I thank Mr. King. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Uh, I speak in favor of this article. I'm very proud of our Board of Health. And I have complete faith that our school resource officers and police department can handle this responsibly. Uh, for those who don't know or aren't aware, uh, HCAM has been airing for the past year, year and a half, a video advertisement or uh, public service announcement showing Officer Phil explaining what the law is to uh, a citizen. Um, so this has been out for over a year. If we watch HCAM, we can see it. Um, in the newspaper, in um, the Independent, and in on Hop News, and on HCAM's website, they've covered the hearings that the uh, Board of Health has held about this. It's been on the front page, great photograph, on Hop News, for instance. Uh, it's been in this article for, we've had it in our laps for three nights. Uh, we all should have been reading it and up to date on this to know about it. It shouldn't be that confusing. And the spelling corrections are very helpful. Uh, but Mr. Miare's explanation is very clear. And I am a little bit confused as why people don't get the idea that we want to send the right message to the citizens of this town, to the children of this town, under the age of 21, under the age of 18, that smoking is not healthy, alcohol is not healthy, and marijuana is not healthy for people who are underage. The same people who are arguing against marijuana are seem to be defending smoking tobacco. Um, I think that if there's someone in the military and they want to smoke and they're 18, great. If they're in the military and that's allowed, that's great. But here in Hopkinton, they're not going to be sold tobacco products unless they're over the age of 21. Same thing for alcohol. Um, and same thing for marijuana eventually, or I guess not, because we don't have it in our town. So my whole point is that they've done a really great job putting this together. 
If they can make changes in the future, fine. But right now, I'm supporting this article as it stands. Thank you. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I um, also stand in support of this article. And just like, um, actually, what Frank said is that, you know, this is going to into effect in July that tobacco products are for 21 and older. Um, I have a student in the high school. I hear how rampant tobacco is going on and vapes, something, another, is going on. There, there is an issue. I think this is just outlining basically what the punishment is. Um, not that, and, um, in all due respect, if someone is in the military or whatever, they still can't get a beer before they head off to Afghanistan because it's a, um, you have to be 21 or over. Um, I think this is just saying, listen, it's a little bit more than a slap on the wrist. You're under 18, we're gonna like tell your parents or your guardian, you're over 18 and between 21, we're gonna slap you with a fine. If you're 19 years old and getting slapped with a $100 fine, you feel it. On my left. Pam Waxlax, 15 Smith Road. I'm not sure, Mr. Moderator, if this is within the four corners, but was there consideration taken for grandfathering people in from the 18 to 21, much like there was in alcohol back in the 80s that I benefited from? Sean? No. <laughs> we, we like short answers. And for a point of clarity, this regulation was put into place 18 to 21 to respond specific or to respond to the vaping issue that we have in the high school in the middle school so if we can add a barrier to acquisition we should see significant changes or significant reductions in the rate of vaping um, and tobacco use in general and we're using the FDA's definition of tobacco so it's anything that contains tobacco or is derived from a tobacco product. So nicotine, if it's, if it's got a nicotine derivative from a tobacco plant, that's falling under the regulation. But it's geared towards, and we define in the regulation um, what a tobacco product is. It's you know, t cigarettes, electronic cigarettes, vaping, and uh, nicotine delivery products. But again, this is to address the vaping issue um, and the tobacco use in our schools. Um, and this, we thought, was the most effective way to protect our children and to eliminate this problem. And our expectation and anticipation is that we will see a significant uh, uh, decrease in the rate of consumption and we'll see an increase in the health of our students and we'll see a reduction or elimination in um, the addiction, you know, that could lead from uh, nicotine exposure through vaping. And, and at the end of the day, it's about protecting the health of our residents. Thank you. On my right. Thank you. Margie Wigan, 213 Saddle Hill Road. I am fully in support of this. Um, I think if we really think about what Sean has said, Think about what we already know. We understand what this means. This means that 18-year-olds um, are going to be handled in a different way than 21-year-olds. This means that, I think to Dan Terry's point, all high school kids wouldn't be allowed to smoke because it doesn't matter, you know, it's not going to be the 17-year-old who can and the 18-year-old who, I mean, 17 who can't, 18 who can. No high, high school students can smoke. I know there were high school students that used to stand across the street from the high school and smoke when they weren't allowed to smoke on high school grounds. Um, I think, there are, to Susan Porter's point, if this is going to be a, a Massachusetts regulation anyway, I think the whole, our, the whole point of this is from a concerned parent point of view, from youth commission point of view, which I've been on for many years, I'm familiar with Officer Phil's efforts in this regard, I appreciate his work. This is to protect our youth from, out, uh, from the addiction that is clearly a part of tobacco use. Um, again, regarding the military, I think if we have a high school student who goes into the military, then it becomes the issue for the military to handle. Um, but I think in terms of our town, I think we want to send the message to our kids that this is not safe. 
you know, and then there's research that the brain isn't fully formed till they're 24, 25. They're not good at making decisions. They see it on TV. Oh, that's cool. I want to do that. Their friends are vaping. They want to vape. Whatever it is, we need to protect them because they don't think well for themselves. So I'm fully in support of this. I, I appreciate the rewording and the editing, um, but I think we basically understand what the issue is. I appreciate your good work on this, and I'm fully supporting it. Thank you. On my left, Dan. Uh, Dan Terry, 9 John Matthew Road. I, 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 I was not in favor of this. I'm not in favor of, uh, of students smoking by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I, I am concerned about the, um, uh, how, how students in the high school would be treated differently. And the comments I just heard, heard uh, were that um, this is a concern for students. I heard this was being a concern about students. And I, I, I feel as though we have rules around this at the state level. This would be at the town level. We have it at the school level. In the MIAA, that, that we've got hundreds and hundreds of athletes in the school that are subjected to this too. So I, I, don't, need, I don't think we need a third layer of rules in here. So once, once again, I, I'm opposed to it for that issue. On my right. Sue Curry's Forest Lane. I came in here tonight and uh, was somewhat agnostic about this, thinking, well, it sounds like a, a good thing. Um, there was a woman before me, though, who raised a point that I am concerned about in terms of not only supporting our youth, which is critical, that's what this town really stands for and gives us the spirit of our town. So I commend you and the Board of Health's efforts in that area. But I also would like to think that we support the efforts of people who are trying to adopt a healthier lifestyle by stopping smoking, and that those people would have advantage to the tools that they need to do that on their own without having to seek a prescription from a doctor, which in today's healthcare world is getting more and more complicated. So solely for that reason, um, I'm concerned about this article. We made a distinction when we talked about marijuana for health reasons and research. Um, and I would be more supportive of this if there was a distinction for positive health reasons. That's all. Thank you. On my left. Hi, Rebecca Roback, Three River Bend Road. I was just checking the uh, status of the legislature moving on this and the house did pass a bill today the senate is likely in governor baker has suggested he'll be supporting this um that does actually does grandfather people who are already 18 at the time of passage i'm just curious if the state law is passed what happens to this bylaw does the state law supersede the bylaw now i'm going to answer a question without having read the statute uh, I have not I I have not seen this piece of legislation. Um, what I would imagine it um, does not do is prohibit um, boards of health from being more stringent than whatever the state law requires. I would expect to see language like that in it, but I I truly have not read it, so I don't know for sure. So I through the moderator, it would need to be in the legislation that the local board of health would have more. Is that how it's usually done? Oh, this is the law. It's much more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, so there's a whole body of case law about, about um, uh, when a local bylaw is in conflict with the state law and whether the state, the state law, it, it, if it's silent, did it really intend to, to um, uh, uh, supersede local regulation? Um, so now we're, you're asking me to, um, to speculate about, uh, about what it says if it's, it, what it says and also what it would mean if it doesn't say anything. Um, I'm good, but I'm not that good. So, uh, we're also speculating as to the passage of a, of a law under consideration. That's right. I, I think we should move away from the hypotheticals and, and uh, move on. And the last comment from Mr. Tedstone. Yes, uh, I was going to move the question and let you know that military can drink. Uh, you at can the only age move. You can only move the question. Okay, then no I no other comment. All right, I won't tell you that military could drink when they're 18. Please, no other comment. <laughs> that's that's truly out of order. Is there a second to move the question? All those in favor of ending debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed?
Okay, it's unanimous, and so debate is ended. And we're now ready for a vote on the um, article as amended. And it is Article 41. It still is the tobacco bylaw as being proposed. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Um, while I believe it's a clear majority, let's stand. All those in favor, please stand. I have eight on the stage. Center front, 22. Center front, 22. Right side, 23. 23 on the right. Center back, 28. Center rear, 28. On the left, 24. 24 on the left, okay. All those opposed, please rise. Four on the stage. Center front five. Center front five. Four on the stage. Six on the right. Six on the right. Center rear five. Center rear five. On the left, 16. 16 on the left. And it's 105 in favor, 36 opposed, so it passes. <coughs> Article 42, correction of obsolete charter references. Mr. Dagnan. So essentially, these are just some inconsistencies that were in our bylaws that were discovered by some of the members of the Charter Review Committee during Charter Review. We did address some things uh, last year, but these are just references in our bylaws to spots in the Charter that don't exist anymore or reference something completely different. And this just brings them into line. So it's really just a housekeeping article. And then I will make a motion that we move the, that the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 42 of the annual town meeting warrant. Is there any discussion on this article? Okay, is there a second to this article? Second. Now is there any discussion? Seeing that there is no discussion, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 43, Historic Preservation Bylaw. Presented by the Historical Commission. My name is Mike Rowan. I'm chairman of the Historical Commission and Article 43, Historic Preservation Bylaw, is very simple. It does two things. It clarifies the language for, thank you. Clarifies the language, that's much better, thank you. <laughs> clarifies the language for a property that uh, has a demolition that's in violation of the bylaw, and it provides a maximum fine 
e no greater than the assessed value of the property. So this does not change the governance of demolition. It does not change the roles and responsibilities of the Department of Municipal Inspection nor the Historical Commission regarding demolition or demolition delay. It simply clarifies the language and provides a maximum fine and does so in language that is legally defensible. Is there any discussion or questions on this article? Oh. I make a motion that Article 43 is passed. Second. I think you need to make a motion that, that you're moving the, the article as is presented in the warrant document. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I make a motion that uh, the article is set, article, as set forth in Article 43 of the Annual Town Meeting Warrant. And there was a second to that, correct? Any discussion? Seeing that there's no discussion, we'll take a vote on Article 43. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it is unanimous and so voted. <coughs> Article 44, street acceptances. Mr. Catino. Mr. Moderator, we move the article as written in the motions um, in warrant document. Capital improvements. Capital improvements recommends approval. And planning board. Planning board recommends approval. Is there any explanation? The explanation is that these streets have been constructed according to plan. They have, uh, I believe the DPW has approved the punch list. All the items have been completed and so they are in fine order to be accepted as public roads. And those roads are as listed. Legacy Farms South from East Main to Clinton, Cobbler's Way from Front Street to Dead End, and Singletary Way from Wedgwood Drive to Dead End. Is there any discussion? Mr. Moderator, Tom Terry, 17 Maple Street. I would like to speak to one of these streets specifically. Um, I happen to have some information that I think it would be helpful in the future. The uh, Legacy Farm South Road that goes from East Main Street down to Clinton Street. I happen to have personally observed some situations there, so I looked into them with the town authorities, and I found a, a strong void in some of our inspection and reporting procedures. It seemed as though um, the company that was inspecting the, the road as it was being built um, didn't seem to send reports of their inspections to anyone. I would ask uh, the chairman of the planning board at the time, Mr. Wisemantle, he never saw any. I asked uh, town manager, he never saw any. I asked uh, John Westerling, they wouldn't come to him, that's not his, his authority. Um, so I was a little, disappointed that there wasn't anything happening, especially since I noticed that the road down there was completely falling apart. And this was just before they ripped up the whole section from the rotary back um, in a northerly direction back towards East Main Street, about oh, maybe 600 feet or more of that land, of that uh, hot top, had completely crumbled. It crumbled to the point where you could actually pick up a clump of the hot top and it would be, uh, you could pull it out and turn it over and you could see nothing down there underneath it except gravel. So I moseyed on up to the town 
hall and saw Elaine, and she showed me the bylaw. It said what, how to construct a road. And what you do when constructing a road is the first thing you do, you compact the soil underneath it once you get to clean soil. And then you put in eight inches of, was it burrow? Is that the word? It's a, it's a hard, uh, con it's a concrete, uh, not a concrete, it's a gravel. And it's been treated and it's a strong gravel. And after you bet that eight, eight inches in, you put in four inches of crushed stone. Then comes two and a half inches of the base coat, followed by, after a winter has gone by, the following finish coat, which is one, one and a half inches. So after they had not put the finish coat on yet, they had put the base coat on. So in pulling some pieces of base coat out, I was very, very sure that there was never any coat of crushed stone. The four inch level of crushed stone that should have been put in there was never put in there. So again, I went back to the different town authorities and Ken didn't know who, who was supposed to be looking at it. Somebody else saw any reports. Uh, we just got through paying $20,000 because we, we, the money has to come from uh, the state on this job and it came out to the, to the town. So 25000 went into our account and in order for Legacy Farms to receive the money for doing the work, they got 20 of it and the other five was held until probably after this is, street is approved. So it comes down to somewhere along the line, the planning board should probably designate someone. Maybe they have to hire someone, or maybe the, the chairman could do it and Tom, rece receive Tom, a salary. To the article, it, I mean, it, there are all sorts of prescriptions here, but are you calling into question whether the work has been done in a way satisfactory enough that it should be accepted or that it should not be accepted? Yes, I am. Okay. Can, can I get a, res a response for you on that before we go further? Okay. All right. Yeah. Mr. Westerling, would you like to uh, comment? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Moderator, uh, the reports were sent to my attention because we had a unique situation where the developer was <laughs> extending a water main uh, on public property, so the engineer was hired to inspect both that water main and the subdivision control. Uh, and all the reports came to me. I have those reports. I'm happy to share them with anyone. It did show that the appropriate work was done, including um, the, the items under the pavement. The, if, I, if I might just state, the four inches of dense graded crushed stone is really a misnomer. That's not just stone. That's, that's a gravel mix with up to uh, large stones. I will accept that, thank you very much, but I have one comment. The bylaw states that the planning board will be the governing body, not the DPW. Is there any comment on that from anyone? I'll ask the uh, chair, vice chair of the planning board to comment. I'm thinking more of <clears throat> let's do something right in the future. So from the planning board's perspective, we looked to the DPW for the acceptance of the roads. My understanding is that it's been completed this week. <clears throat> and to that point, uh, the host com community agreement obligates the town to accept the Legacy Farm South as a public way if constructed in accordance with the town requirements. Seeing that completed and accepted, we looked at that as acceptance. But, but the acceptances, Mr. DeYoung, the acceptances would be done by the planning board. Well, I think, would, I think what, he, what he indicated was that the actual inspection is delegated to the Department of Public Works. No. Well, jo plan John, go ahead. Again, through you, Mr. Moderator, this was a unique situation in that the developer was doing two things. He was building Legacy Farm South, and he was also extending a water main, which became a public water main on a public roadway. And that's why the planning board uh, deferred the responsibility for inspection through the Department of Public Works and the engineer was selected in accordance with the 
the regulations and was agreed to by the planning board and uh, the DPW. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, just uh, in closing, in, in fairness to the, the subject, and we've gone far enough off the four corners, could I just get a comment just for the future from Ken as to what he, he sees in this situation going forward, and could we tighten things up a little bit? Ken Weismantle, please. Uh, it he, would be inappropriate. Ken is no longer on the planning board. Well, he was at the time. <clears throat> I, know, I know, but if we're going forward, uh, I would ask that's fine. If, if the vice chair has any comment about future procedures. So I'm, I'm open to hearing any thoughts or comments, Mr. Terry, about going I, forward what the planning yeah. board should do. And, Thank you. And going forward, again, I would suggest that you connect with the planning board after the meeting and, and uh, again, express those concerns. Thank you. Okay. On my right. Mr. Moderator, Roy McDowell representing Legacy Farms. Uh, to answer a few questions, the road was uh, privately paid for. However, there was Weston and Sampson was a firm that was on the job every day of work being done, who did weekly reports in accordance with the rules and regulations and the specs and the plans and the proper gravel base. And as John pointed out correctly, when it talks about crushed stone, it's really a one inch minus. It goes all the way down to stone dust. So it's really a mix. We have the appropriate base. We did in fact replace a section of the road down by the circle. And the reason we replaced it was during two and a half years of construction, Pulte driving their excavators with heavy tracks over time and time again, frankly destroyed that section of road. So we took that section of road out, we replaced it, we've recently paved it, and the road now meets all specifications. Thank you. Seeing that there's no further discussion, I believe we're ready for a vote on Article 44, Street Acceptances. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it is uh, almost unanimous, clearly passed. Clearly better than two-thirds majority. Article 45, easement to Clinton Street. Mr. Catino. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Mr. Westerling. Thank you, through you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Josh, may I have the slide for Article 45? While, while you're calling the slide up, the Board of Selectmen have recommended approval. The Board of Selectmen has recommended approval. Capital improvements. Capital improvements recommends approval. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Through you, Mr. Moderator, we are seeking roughly 3,300 square feet on property owned by number two Clinton Street. If you'll notice here, the, uh, you can see the intersection of Clinton Street with East Main Street, and the rectangular parcel is the property owned by the residents at number two Clinton Street. And in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see there is a horizontal line and then part of a curvature line. That is the area of the proposed easement. What we discovered in constructing the sidewalks on East Main Street was that since before the 1950s, Clinton Street is on the property owned by number two Clinton Street. So we, uh, we were able to uh, negotiate a deal with those property owners who were very generous in allowing us to construct the sidewalks on their private property in the area of this easement and to leave Clinton Street where it currently remains. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Okay. Seeing no discussion, then uh, we'll take a vote to leave Clinton Street where it is. Article 45 easement to Clinton Street. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 46, utility easement, Hayden Row. Mr. Catino. The, uh, we move that the, uh, the motion as printed in the articles and motions document. 
And the, so the Board of Selectmen has recommended approval? And the, and the Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And capital improvements? Capital improvements recommends approval. Thank you. Any discussion, Mr. Catino? Thank you. So this is the, uh, the utility poll at, for the easement for uh, the Marathon School, which is already in. So the poll and the anchor are in this easement, and uh, we're just looking for the town to go ahead and accept it. <clears throat> Any discussion? All those in favor of this utility easement are under Article 46 signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Thank you. We have already considered Article 47. Article 48, Pilot Agreement, Clean Energy Collective. Uh, before we begin uh, any aspect of this, Mr. Herr is, is stepping off the, the uh, Board of Selectmen. He is recusing himself from the Board due to his professional association with the solar industry. With that, I'll turn to Mr. Catino for the motion. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. And discussion or comments from the board first? Yes. Yeah. First comment is the uh, Board of Selectmen recommends uh, uh, approval of this article. Okay. And through the town moderator, by way of explanation, the January 27, 2017 special town meeting authorized the Board of Selectmen to negotiate payment in lieu of taxes or pilots agreements for solar energy projects in the town of Hopkinton in accordance with section 38H of chapter 59 of the Mass General Laws, provided that pilot agreements negotiated by the Board of Selectmen in accordance with this vote shall be subject to ratification by a town meeting. This Article 6 town meeting approval of a 25-year term agreement for pilot for real property and personal property by and between Clean Energy Collective and the town of Hopkinton. Clean Energy Collective will build and operate a solar electric generating facility at 147 Lumber Street with an expected nameplate capacity of approximately two megawatts or such other capacity as may be determined after the final design and engineering plans are completed. The payments in lieu of real and personal property taxes over the life of this agreement are expected at inception to approximate the real and personal property tax payments that would otherwise be determined under Mass General Law Chapter 59 based upon the full and fair cash valuation of the project. Uh, this agreement has been reviewed by Town Council it has been recommended for approval by the Board of Selectmen, and the assessing department has okayed the methodology used for calculating the pilot taxes. Is there any discussion? Questions? Mr. Chairman, Kevin Shea, Pleasant Street. Seeking clarification, it, I think I heard them say <laughs> that in lieu of taxes, which we think or that would have been assessed, they're just going to pay a fixed amount. In each of the 25 years. And that amount is included, in fact, in the agreement that we shared publicly through the town website. Okay. And um, is that for the future, do we have to do that for every um, <clears throat> farm, solar farm that comes online? That in other words, we've created the precedent that we're going to do, uh, collect taxes in this form for every solar farm that comes into the town? I think as was explained in 2017, we were faced with a situation where the mass general law was somewhat unclear 
and there were threats that some companies were going to challenge how the towns levy taxes on such properties. And thus, the tool that was given to the selectmen by town meeting is the authorization for them to negotiate when these opportunities arise. Thank you. Mr. Harrow. Ed Harrow, H. Spring Lane, member of CONCOM. Has this piece come to any town boards and been approved at this point? Do you, do you mean the pilot agreement or the project itself? The project itself. I believe from Elaine the answer is yes. The answer is yes? The answer is yes from Elaine. On my left. Frank Dorso, 173 Saddlefield Road, Planning Board. I was just going to say the same thing Lane did. So I stand in support of this pilot agreement. It, the Planning Board has reviewed it, worked with the neighbors, projects in place, pilot agreements in place. It's all good. Thank you. <clears throat> On my right. John Palmer, 87 Main Street. Um, has the Board of Assessors looked at this and do they have an opinion or can they um, provide information as to what, how this would work tax-wise? Through the town moderator, I'll defer to John Nis, uh, the town's principal assessor. Mr. Moderator, John Neese, Town Assessor. Uh, the Board of Assessors has uh, reviewed this agreement and they did uh, make a motion at one of their meetings to accept the tax agreement. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Chris Hagberg, 22 Alexander. This solar farm is behind my home. It's roughly, I think, 11 acres of land that was woods that is now flat and going to be solar panels. So my question is about the funds or taxes. What are we talking? So yearly, what is he, what are they now paying? So it's like a flat rate and what would the potential be that they would be paying if we weren't accepting this flat rate? Mr. Moderator, the total tax over 25 years is uh, just over $1 million. I could give you the exact figure if you'd like. Uh, and it's structured with a payment of approximately 59000 in year one, and then uh, payments of approximately $42,000 a year in years two through 24. Uh, and we are required to consider the full cash value of the property. So uh, these are essentially the same type of taxes they would uh, pay through an annual tax bill. And yeah, if it's a business, and how many acres of land is it? I'm sorry, the question is? How many acres? Two, to me, please. Uh, Mr. Moderator, the total parcel at uh, 147 Lumber Street is about 60 acres, and the solar facility is uh, on approximately 11 and a half acres of that area. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does answer the question. I'm questioning the potential. It's a business that's being run out of that. So it's, I'm wondering how you tax businesses or. Well, I can't answer the question, Mr. Moderator, on the solar field, how we tax businesses, but I can explain how we arrived at the value and therefore the tax of the solar development. So um, we do a combination of uh, several things. We look at the 25 year lease term. Um, we um, value the personal property, which is the solar panels and the, uh, the support systems and the inverters and whatever else the project needs. That's a personal property item. Uh, and then we tax the land uh, using our land curve, similar to other commercial property in town, both as a prime site that they put the panels on and then excess land for the, uh, for the remaining area. Uh, and then we uh, put the tax in starting in year one at the actual tax rate. And then we use an incremental tax increase of one and a half percent per year. 
Thank you. On my right. Dave Paul, 7 Mandolin Drive, uh, Planning Board member. Um, I'm in support of this. This is the financial side of it, but I just wanted to make a comment or two about the previous questions. Um, yes, this was a project that became, came before the Planning Board. However, I was the only member to vote against it because I couldn't see the value of clearing out a forest to, to put in solar panels. So um, just along the lines of what the neighbor said there, um, if this is something I ask the public, if this is something that we don't want to do in the future, please let your planning board members know. So um, just want to make that point. On my left. Pam Waxlax, 15 Smith Road. Through you, Mr. Moderator, maybe Mr. Neese could answer this. He had mentioned an increase of one and a half percent each year, yet the uh, slide that was up before shows it's, uh, I think it was 59,000 the first year and about 42,000 subsequent years. Our property taxes increase every year, so this would not increase on an annual basis? Mr. Neese. Mr. Moderator, um, first I should comment that I shouldn't say things from memory. The tax increase uh, is actually 1% per year and not 1.5%. Um, again, I don't know how much of an explanation you want, but we have a, um, an Excel spreadsheet with a 25-year term for the lease. We use a depreciation schedule, um, which reduces the value of the personal property um, over time. Uh, we value the personal property. The, the total estimated cost right now is $2.485, million. Uh, we use a commercial land value, as I have suggested, um, um, three and a half acres as a prime site and then 7.953 acres as excess land. Um, we start with the current tax rate of 1690 and we increase that at the 1% per year. Uh, the reason we do that is we know that our tax here in Hopkinton does not go up 2.5% each year. Uh, in the three years that I have been here, it has actually gone down in, those, in two of those three years. So we tried to, to look historically at what has happened to the tax rate and come up with a number that might be appropriate. And when all of those items are calculated out, they come to a total uh, to the town of uh, one million uh, seventy two thousand dollars and one hundred and seventy four dollars over the twenty five year term now the solar company asked to um, have equal payments in each of those twenty five years uh, we said no to that um, so we structured it at fifty nine two oh six in the first year uh, and then the remaining year is the slide forty two two oh seven what would whatever was up there the reason we did that is we only get growth in the first year, so if we agreed to a reduced figure in year one, we would lose about a million dollars in growth. So we said no, we said in the first year you have to pay the 59 and then we would agree to equal payments in the remaining 24 years. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further discussion, uh, I'll call for a vote with respect to Article 48, the Pilot Agreement for Clean Energy Collective. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's a clear majority, and so it passes. Okay, before we get to the final motion, <laughs> uh, I would like to thank and uh, I, apologize if, I apologize if I miss anyone. The deputy moderator, the counters, the town clerk, the board of selectmen, the appropriations committee, Mr. Kamalo and Ms. Lazarus, all of the facilities personnel who have helped uh, organize the, the room and the screens and in our technical desk, town council, HCAM, and all of you, the voters of, of the town of Hopkinton, who give voice to our form of democracy. With that, I'll turn to the Board of Selectmen for the final motion. Mr. Moderator, I am honored and pleased that we move that the annual town meeting adjourn until the date of the annual town election, May 21st, 2018, 
held at the Hopkinton Middle School Gymnasium, and further, that the annual town meeting shall be dissolved upon the close of the polls on the date of the annual town election. <laughs> Doesn't need a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it is unanimous. Thank you very much.